this audio is brought to you by John Bumpus and the Nutritional Balancing Friends Facebook group. Please remember that none of the products, claims, or programs from this call have been evaluated by any government health body. The content and information found within this audio from John Bumpus, attendance of this group call, and in our affiliated Nutritional Balance Facebook group is for informational purposes only. The content is in no way intended as medical advice, as a substitute for medical counseling, or as treatment care for any disease or health condition, and nor should it be construed against because that would be illegal. Always work with a qualified health professional before making any changes to your diet, supplement use, prescription drug use, lifestyle, or exercise activities. Please understand that you assume all risks from use, non-use, or misuse of this information. Thank you. Yeah, so does anyone want to talk about some healing crises, healing reactions, Herxheimer stuff, tracings? Give you guys a minute, maybe someone does. That's a good thing about Zoom, you can put your hand up, like, I want to talk. <laughs> so I imagine most people have read the article on Dr. Wilson's website that pretty much covers the basic definitions of a healing crisis, uh, retracing. He talks a little bit about some things that you can do about it. I have done a short recording the other day, I think it was like 12 minutes or something, of basically just blabbering on about healing reactions and not to use drugs to stop them. Does anyone have any questions on any of those? Don't forget some of you might be on mute still, so if you could unmute when you want to talk. Well, it does take a long time to actually figure out all the different components of a hair test, but probably the easiest kind of jump in to do that. Um, well, you can find it a lot on Dr. Wilson's website, first off. They talk about like the oxidation rates, the metabolic type, whatever you prefer to use. Um, talks about, you know, sodium. Yeah. It, it does take a little bit to, because there's a couple different layers when you're actually trying to talk about tissue neural analysis itself. And that's because, first off, at least on an ARL test, you get about 11 nutritional minerals, and then you got, I think, four extra, you know, additional ones. And then from that point forward, you kind of got to know what the, each mineral does in the body. Um, Dr. Wilson simplified a lot of it by saying, for example, elevated calcium is a lot like a shell. You know, and it's a lot of people block themselves off from the external worlds, where calcium is very numbing to the emotions and things like that. So he has got a lot of good information on that. Um, Dr. Rick Maltaire is a book, Strands of Health. That one's really good. They're very simple to read. You know, he's a pretty good guy. I don't always agree with him, but that's a different talk. But he talks a lot about the basics of nutritional balancing and hair tissue mineral analysis. Dr. Rick Maltaire, he's got his book, yeah, he pops in in the group just to, you know, tell us how good TEI is. you probably hear that, <laughs> whatever. Um, yeah, so he's got a really good book, though, on the topic of, of hair tissue mineral analysis. Um, Dr. Wilson's book, I might have it around within a week, let me see very basic. It's simple and it kind of outlines the uh, this one right here. Well, when I signed up to be a practitioner with them a long time ago, I think in like 2014 or something, 2013, he um, gave it as part of the as part of the course materials. So I got like that book. I'm in Australia right now, so I don't have the other ones because I don't bring so much to the far lands that I'm at. Um, but that book is very simple. You can find even the outdated ones, which still talk about a lot of the basics of hair tissue mineral analysis. The other way you can do it is you can go on the ARL website. And ARL's got a lot of cool information that even nowadays uh, a lot of practitioners resort to if they go back and refer to it. 
it's a lot like Dr. Wilson's website, but I prefer it, to be honest, to read his website all the time because it's a little bit more directed just to air tissue neuroanalysis. I mean, the book basically outlines chronic you know, infections and nutritional balances and copper toxicity pretty much being everything. But, I mean, <laughs> you, you do see, like, a lot where he's coming at. That's a great intro to it, I think. And a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the ARL uh, newsletters were actually written by Dr. Wilson. So it's funny when they don't really agree with Dr. Wilson but then still source ARL newsletters because they were, for the most part, written by Dr. Wilson again. It just doesn't have his name on it. So that's kind of how that works. Um, it's free. Like, I mean, you can totally just go on the website and read. Um, the other option is when you get your hair test from the practitioner you're working with, you can always get the other profile that includes the actual overview of everything. And it comes with like 30 pages, 35 pages or something. Um, and it does explain a lot of different things. Like some practitioners, I know I usually give a write-out, which is a blessing and a curse at the same time because it scares everybody. But it kind of gives you an outline of like, well, you have an imbalance of potassium ratio. It has to do with electrical conductivity of the cell um, and different things like that. Obviously, in different inflammation indicators, such as, you know, very high minerals or very low minerals. But, I mean, a real good interpretation, if you get it in a PDF form from a practitioner, which not everyone does, um, but when they do, Usually it's very informative. It's like a mini course if you were to take someone. But the easiest way is just to get it straight from ARL. You just ask uh, the practitioner pretty much for the other profile, the one that gives uh, supplement recommendations. And yeah, you'd ask for like a profile two. And that will give you a better tissue mineral analysis and a thorough uh, descriptive. Uh, interpretation and the trends and all that but some practitioners just do it without ARL because after you've done it for long enough you just kind of know a lot of people already have the documents how to do that so that, that's also a really good way to find that out no problem yeah loud and clear Yeah, that was that was the idea. That's Ruben here. Yeah, we have the half hour um, at the beginning to do that. But if you want to do it now, Ruben, I don't think I think you were late to join because you called me and then uh, I spoke with you while everyone watched me because my mic wasn't working. <laughs> so if you want to do it now, sure thing. Yeah, um, I originally was going to only do an hour, and I thought, well, that's going to be crammed, and you can't relax, right? And then I was thinking, well, an hour and a half, and then I was, I just kind of danced around on different ideas, basically, it was me talking to myself, and, and I figured two hours is probably the best, we'll do an hour and a half actually talking about topics, and then a half hour in the beginning, just to kind of do introduction, because every call, I imagine, is going to be new people or people that have seen others and they don't really know them, or, you know, we can figure it out, you know, talking that half hour in the beginning. So, yeah. So this call was supposed to be about uh, healing crises. A lot of people have had them. Basically, like, I, I, hate, I don't like to call them healing reactions, personally. When they're called healing reactions, it's kind of like your body's reacting to some entity that's attacking it which if you read Wilson, might, you might agree with that. I don't. Um, I like to think that the body is always trying to find a, um, a state of balance, a state of wholeness, and the actual diseases that are expressed are actually the body's effort to find homeostasis right now. So I, I prefer to call it a healing response, really, but it's called healing reactions in this kind of group, I guess you could say, in this niche little circle that we got. Um, so, yeah, the healing response, I like to say, but I'll use healing reaction for this. 
some people call it the Herxheimer reaction. Um, and there's like some different talks on the internet. You probably have heard someone say like, oh, when you go through a Herxheimer reaction, you poison yourself. I think Dr. Shade talks about that, which isn't completely accurate from my experience. And I think others can kind of chime in on that. But your body's got to move one thing around to do something else. It's like when you clean out your drawer, you know, in the kitchen or something, you got to open it up and take stuff out. And you got a mess, and then, you know, you got to clean it up to put the stuff that you want in the drawer and take out the stuff that's crap. Um, so it's not like it's a bad thing. It's just stuff you got to do. Body kind of works like that as well. So I just don't like to say that we poison ourselves or something, get toxic from doing it. Because it's the body's way of healing. I'm sure a lot of you have heard the uh, audio that I put up. I kind of went over a lot of it. Um, but for those that didn't listen to it, the uh, Herxheimer reaction, or whatever you want to call it. So it, basically they're like temporary symptoms. And you can get uh, a temporary worsening of symptoms, which most people are familiar with. You could have like an ear infection. It gets very inflamed, very uh, annoying. You don't really want to deal with it. It could seem like it's getting worse. Um, but usually a healing reaction only lasts like three, four days. If it's gone for like a week and a half or something like that, it is possible that it's a healing reaction. But the longer something goes, the more you're kind of getting into the aspect of where it's more of a burden that the body's dealing with and your body's trying to find balance. And disease kind of expresses itself as the body trying to find homeostasis when it's making compensations, whether it be toxin input, you know, chronic infections, copper toxicity, whatever you want to say, maybe, you know, exposed to a bunch of aluminum as a kid because your mom liked making baked potatoes, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, but most of the time, a healing reaction are usually not very uh, serious, but they can be, right? Um, I'm sure everyone at one point in the group has seen like Svetlana, who's got a lot of, probably not a real name, um, but she's got a lot of pictures of like, you know, scabbing on her face that she's gone through or like her toe skins and all that kind of stuff starts to come off. And those are the more serious ones, which are still healing reactions, but they can be scary. And if you're not really uh, akin to the natural medicines, you totally think something's wrong, right? Like, <laughs> I'm sick, go to the hospital, get some antibiotics or something. So we usually welcome those on the program. Some people have been on here for three years, like Rachel. Yikes. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, when you've been on for a couple of years, you kind of notice different things that you're going through. And sometimes when you're new, like six months even, three months, uh, nine months, you can get some new symptoms that you're not really used to, right? And they, they can be scary. So if you're going through anything like that, it is best to talk with your practitioner about them. I I know just from experience, if you with a Wilson practitioner, that they will most likely say it's always a healing reaction. But be careful, as a lot of people have seen in the group, it's not always the case. So second opinions are valued, and doctors are great, and they, they help you. But any other time, most of us don't like them. The other aspect of healing reactions is the retracing, which I think is very cool. Retracing is basically when the body re-experiences substances that you've taken in the past, or you can kind of get illnesses that you've had in the past and they come up again, or even traumas, right? So, for example, I find often on the program that when I start doing my supplementation, most usually at the beginning of a new program that I've set up for a most recent hair test, that oftentimes I basically re-experience old things that have happened in my life, but I see it like in my mind's eye, which you could say is your pineal gland or something, right? But I, I visualize it and I can see it almost from like a third person point of view, like I'm no longer, um, you know, first person, but I'm on the outside of it, and I can look at it happening. 
and when I see what's going on, sometimes I think, wow, that was really harsh, or, oh, it shouldn't have happened like that. Or, you know, it, it might hurt me. It might get me emotionally charged. I might get angry about it even. A few times I've, you know, cried. Uh, a lot of different things, just because you realize what you might not have seen then, um, it comes up again. Uh, oftentimes the body does this because it's its way of going back and healing old things, right? So, has anyone else had a retracing experience like that, or? Yeah. Um, I myself know. But yeah, that's interesting. That's cool. I, I didn't think but that is really cool. Absolutely. Uh, that's a good point, though, because I mean, we don't talk about the meridians a lot in the programs. But, you know, there's at least twelve of them, and they do play important roles. Um, I don't necessarily, personally, I don't see them as being 100% correlated with the physical body because I like the subtle energy sciences and I look at the quantum field stuff and all that, but I'm also kind of scientific and nerdy, right? <laughs> I love reading like harsh scientific studies and all that, and I can't piece them together. So the only way I've been able to do it, and maybe we'll do a call on it at one point, is either different levels of the human body. Right? We have like our physical body, and then we have uh, more refined bodies. It's kind of like a topic from Ayurveda. They talk about different koshas, different layers. Um, and I like to think about the meridians as being like um, what's called the vital body, which is kind of like the auric field or the etheric field. You probably have heard those terms at one point. And I, I think they influence the body's physical expressions, but they're not kind of what runs the show. So I've seen people like think that the acupuncture is going to save their life, and it might help their addiction or something, but it doesn't fix their liver congestion, you know, like they still have whether it be iron buildup, copper buildup or something, it doesn't actually fix it. So when you do like a coffee enema or stuff, it can totally influence the field, which, which just like Ruben brings up. It impact your eyes, it can give you shoulder pain, you know, you might get weird palpitations or spasms in the muscles along those meridian areas. So I think that's really cool that we can just point it out. Mm. Yeah. It's always weird when you have foreign stuff come out of you, especially when you try and eat clean and you do the best that you can and then you know, yeah, whether it's biofilms or, you know, parasites, liver flukes, any kind of stuff like that just comes out and you think, man, like, <laughs> I did not think that was there, you know? Um, yeah, I totally agree. Um, it took me maybe four or five months before I even started learning about nutrition. Well, I started learning about it, but before I started applying, you know, those techniques and ideas to my way of living, because some of you might know, but I, I was a raw foodist for about six years, you know, so I did raw food. I didn't do raw meat, but I was like pretty much high fat, um, almost vegan. I still ate eggs, but I did upwards of like 10 eggs a day, like, you know, raw stuff. <laughs> so, um, I did all that raw stuff, and then when I started considering like cooked vegetable, like that was a big one for me because uh, I was kind of in the ideology that like, well, I'm sure anyone that's come across the raw kind of dogma is that when it comes fresh from nature, that's the way humans should take it. But the more I learned, and the more I learned that it's not actually, you know, very accurate. Um, many tribes, for example, cook roots of um, any ancient civilizations that had some sort of grain, you know, and that was cooking for the most part. So when I had to implement some of Dr. Wilson's stuff, I was very hesitant for a long time because um, it was such a change for me, right? By the time I was really reading about Dr. Wilson, I was going to 
start the program. Like I had all the stuff. I bought TMG. I bought uh, vitamin D. <laughs> you know, um, I bought just all this different stuff. Kelp was pretty much the basic, you know, ones that I started with. I was gonna do it. I was gonna commit. Um, I was a vegetarian at the time, and I, I've already started to cook, and I already started to, you know, not eat pure raw foods, but. Um, Eating meat was a big one because I had to eat that every day, right? <laughs> at least four ounces, uh, twice a day at least. And like, it, it didn't fit with me, but I had to prepare it mentally for changes. And I thought, well, if I really want to change, I'm going to have to change what I do each day, right? Um, and if I want to improve my health, I got to do something different. I can't just keep doing what I was doing. Um, so, the mental preparation just for the program itself is big, but then learning about detoxification because, <laughs> let's be honest, like um, for those that have had a copper down or those that um, have circulated some toxins around and couldn't properly eliminate, uh, they're not fun. Really, even the healing reaction themselves, a lot of them are like, they happen at awkward times. Right, <laughs> like for me, I commonly get ear uh, stuff because when I was a kid, I had a lot of mouth work done, and uh, you know they drill holes in there, and put some, they put mercury in my mouth, right, and, and I had a lot of infections, and it affected my ears, nose, throat, and growing up, I had a lot of, um, I was sick a lot just in school, so I would always have a cough, I always have a runny nose, and. Um, that I learned down the road, you know, especially from hair tissue mineral analysis, that it was my adrenals, right? Really, they got kind of out of balance, let's say. <laughs> um, my adrenals were pretty much shot, which I, I could have knew that ahead of time, but it takes a lot to really know what you're facing. Because I have clients to this day that come and they're like, I want to get the mercury out, like now. And I, I, all I can say is, like, they're not ready. You know, and even if you were to try and do that, oh gosh, like it's not fun, right? Um, so I, I think that's good advice you got there to uh, prepare for the program because a lot of stuff can happen, a lot of changes can happen, especially when you come to get one thing fixed and you get another problem. That's always the worst, right? No, I was just thinking like, like someone comes for like, you know, they got bad breath, or they got, you know, joint pain and then all of a sudden they get like you know difficulty urinating or something They're like oh man like they, they get kind of angry about it it's like you don't realize all the changes your body's got to make and all the compensations it's made in the past and to try and just you can do a symptomatology right symptom based natural medicine which a lot of people do but when we do nutritional balancing we're working on a more deeper level and we go inside right we don't just work on the outside layer make the house look nice we clean the inside as well you know so a cell could be a metaphor for a home which I think it could be sometimes <laughs> yeah yeah the itchy one sucks I mean I the last week or so I've been getting things like that right all of a sudden my skin will just start to break out my arm or something and all this stuff, and it gets real itchy and burns, and then it's gone. Or like the skin on my feet will just crack. All of a sudden, it's not like my feet are dry. It's just oh, I just feel. At least it feels like the skin just cracks. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, at one point, a couple of months ago, the other ones I was going to was like um, I had to keep waking up in the middle of the night to go to the washroom, which I I'd never had to do that ever in my life. I could drink as much water as I wanted, go to bed, and be fine. But for like a month or so, I just had to get up, go to the toilet, and I mean, it, it bugged me, to be honest, because I was like, well, why is this doing this? And then I had to think, like, well, I've been taking the program serious. You know, I've been doing changes. And, I mean, the body does what it wants at its own rate. Um, that's why we don't focus on one particular element to fix when we do a program. We mostly work with the body as a whole because at the end of the day, the body's in charge. 
you know, the life force does what it wants, and it's always looking at the best interest of you, right? So even a disease reaction, uh, a disease of some kind, is always an attempt for a healing response, right? It's just a lot of the time, especially when someone's not working on, you know, eliminating heavy metals and nourishing their body, they get, they progressively spiral down getting sicker and sicker because they're not, the body keeps trying to make compensation, it keeps trying to make compensations. And they don't actually ever experience a real healing reaction. They only get what we call disease reaction, right? Because they're not doing the whole thing. Um, of course, you could be following a program like I think um, Galena or Galka had done, which is when you're following the program 100%, and you know you get someone that tells you um, you're not doing it right. Well, someone saying, and that is always awkward, but. That's when it's always best to at least try other things as well, especially for identifying diseases, right? Because that's what the doctors are good at. Not good at fixing them, but they can point out when something's bad. And if you're subclinical, usually they can't tell you anything, right? You're normal, you're fine. So, <laughs> so it, it, it is always good to follow through, you know, with other modalities. But yeah, it's a game changer when you think about that symptoms aren't bad, right? Like they're your body's attempt to heal. But there's one cool concept that helped me kind of grasp a lot of the nutritional balancing stuff, which was um, Dr. Bruce Ames' work, and he does a lot of nutritional kind of research. And I, I think one of his mentors is um, something Fitzpatrick. I forget her name. Oops. Anyway, he's got a concept that he talks about how the body makes adaptations. So when you don't have adequate amounts of, say, zinc, you can build up like things like cadmium, and that kind of fits into the en enzyme binding sites that kind of get fucked up with heavy metals that Dr. Wilson talks about, which I think is really cool. Oh, you got a, a question. Brickyl. How do you know when you expel candida? I would love to be able to identify what is what that is expelled after a coffee enema. Yeah, how do you know when you expel candida? And she would love to know um, how you were able to identify what was expelled after the coffee enema. Yeah, it's just come off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you want any pictures of her still, you know, for identification. I highlight that thought. But <laughs> <laughs> I imagine there would be a discharge of some kind, probably white, because that's the color that it usually... I've never done one, but yeah, I read about it. Oh, the, the wrap, you know, Erin and I were just talking about that this morning. She, she uses it to banter with me. She's like, you didn't put it up your nose and around your ding dong yet. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I will say that whenever you do um, try and attack, if you will, candida or any other parasite or something orally, that you always have to build... Um, Make sure that you're eliminating properly because, I mean, the coffee enema, the vaginal coffee, coffee implantation, all that stuff, that's more safe in some senses for them when if you were to go on like a oral cleanse. Because what happens is if you were to break up, like if you notice candida is kind of like a biofilm, it's a lot like mucus that comes out of your nose and stuff like that. So if you were to break that biofilm up, they actually use for the matrix to create that biofilm. They use a lot of toxins like heavy metals and things like that. That's why they, they use candida, or sorry, candida uses the copper, for example, and iron as well. And that's why when a lot of times when you're going through a copper dump or something like that, you can also get a lot of yeast infections and stuff like that because it's completely correlated. Um, as the biofilm starts to break down, copper is released into the blood, and when you 
get um, it's called endotoxins, right? Toxins endogenously produced, produced inside your body. And it, it can also stimulate a healing reaction, which a lot of people are familiar with. They say when you go and you go on a candy to cleanse or something, you feel like crap and you feel better. So that they do go through a minute healing reaction when they do the oral way. But I do think that if you can directly approach the liver flukes and, and all that through direct coffee uh, enema, I think you're better off for it than if you were to uh, do the oral method. If I could say that, because I, I think it's safer to expel them as a whole rather than to break them down. Because Holda Clark used a lot of essential oils, uh, a three-day cleanse along with uh, walnut husk tincture, and she used that. Can someone doing the dishes maybe just mute their mic, please? <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yeah, and there's also, like, if you think about the body as, um, I do it a lot, it's as within, so without, right? It's, it's kind of like an old kind of, um, kind of saying that we do, right? Like, as, like, in the stars, so on the earth, and as within, so without, as it is in your body, so it is in your external world. If you consider that the bacteria plays a valuable role in ecosystem restoration and where you can have old trees that fall down and then you get mushrooms and fungus that actually break that down um, it also gives a purpose for those microbes inside of the body so you don't always want to completely clean yourself out you do need them and having an overgrowth of bacteria oftentimes is a sign of a healing reaction either your body's healing itself and making changes, or um, eventually that the bacteria will have to be dissipated somehow. So the body will eventually attack it and get rid of that as well. This everything needs to be in balance, right? Um, so when you do go through healing reaction, you can totally have discharges, like you're saying. Yeah. No, you can get all sorts of weird feelings too, right? And sometimes they're not necessarily the way your emotional state is, but just kind of the way your bi biology feels at the moment. Because there's an inter kind of relationship between your body chemistry and your mind. And they're not completely um, separate, but they're not completely attached either. So you can have experiences in the mind. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to like have a a complete physical um, symptom. Of course, I mean, you can trace mind thoughts or affect your biology. Uh, that's pretty common nowadays. But I, what I mean, like, is a little bit of anxiety in the mind is different than when you have that intense feeling of anxiety, right? It's just a little different. Um, I, one of the ones I get a lot of emotional kind of aspects would be uh, anger. Um, especially especially when I'm eliminating lead uh, every time I, I can almost tell you now when <laughs> my next hair test will come up higher on lead just because um, I'll be sitting there and I'll be doing whatever I could be reading or you know just it doesn't matter what I'm doing I could be making dinner or something and then I'll get a wave of just anger and it, it's not necessarily like anything is um, triggered me or anything it's just I get this feeling and I just, oh, it just bugs me, right? But I know when I get that feeling, especially when my underarms start smelling different, <laughs> that I'm, I'm detoxing a heavy metal of some kind and it's not necessarily like that I am angry or, you know, something made me angry, which is always interesting to deal with on the program because... Uh, before the program, you think your emotions are your emotions and your body's your body, or you might know that there's a relationship or something, but it's hard to put together that maybe that anger isn't necessarily you actually angry, <laughs> right? That is the one. Yeah, we can hear you now, absolutely. Um, she was wondering if you were bedridden or if you were still like at a functional state where you were still going about, you just knew something was up. Yeah. Uh, that's one of my major concerns because I mostly, you know, I'm on the internet for a living, 
And then, <laughs> you know, I always got to be on the phone or around the phone, you know, with email, email consultations and all that. So a lot of the time I like, I try and keep my phone away, but it's part of like, I wouldn't be able to have the phone without a phone. So, you know, I kind of need to find a balance. So we've gotten like little things. Maybe okay, I'll show you because it's not a better way to do it. But I'm just going to flip my camera and you can see the grounding pad under the computer. Right there. Right? So that's plugged into the ground of the power board there. So that it's an earthing mat. It's plugged into the ground. Yeah, and then we got on the computer here. I don't know how effective it is, but it's a lift up the computer. So not drop it. It's a uh, bulletproof earthing mat. Or that's a defender pad. That was when we were at Rinse and Bulletproof. And that was like the thing to help with your computer. So, you know, just little things that I don't know if they're very beneficial, but. I take it as a precaution, you know, especially something like EMF exposure because it's ridiculous, especially in Australia with uh, everything being solar powered, and um, it's probably the worst ever here. <laughs> That's one thing I've learned. The EMF is crazy here. Um, now, I, when I first got into nutritional balancing, the thing I worried most about was blue corn because I thought it took me forever to stop eating chips and, you know, all that stuff. And I was eating, you know, the beanitos and all the lentil chips and all that other stuff, which is probably crap for you anyway. But I was eating all that stuff, and um, I finally got off it, and then Wilson says eating corn chips, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, oh, man. So I was very hesitant, you know, it only take a little bit at a time. And then I had I go through exactly the same where I so many of them and when I got here in Australia we got a really good company um, it's called Dona Chalita for the Australian here uh, and they got the corn chip is completely different like in America the corn chip is uh, got a lot of air in it but when you get the one uh, that I've been getting now it's so dense it's like it's literally like a tortilla that they cooked a blue corn tortilla that they, I guess they fried it. I'm not keen on fried foods, but it's part of it, <laughs> you know. So, um, but it's a complete game changer because it's not like full of air and it doesn't have like that completely satisfying crunch. Yeah, I will. It's going to Toledo, but yeah, I will um, send a brand. But the chips are completely different, and it's a lot harder to um, eat as many. That's one thing I've learned because you can pretty much um, satisfy with even small amount now. Whereas in America, well, I was in Canada, but the chip was like mostly air, and it was like I could just keep eating them because it don't have the bubbles in it and stuff. It wasn't really a full chip. So maybe play around with the chips. Yeah, the different chip was a game changer for me because um, I was very similar to Meredith. I was eating a lot, and then I had the more condensed chip, and that was a lot better. Um, but uh, the other thing is sometimes you kind of really have to listen to your body where when you go through increased uh, stages of stress you could say where you'll need more carbs in general and it's kind of an interplay of when your body is craving something maybe you actually need what it's craving and then there's the other side of the coin which is where it's actually an addiction kind of thing where it could be an emotional eating or something so there's two sides to it I mean uh, sometimes like, I go through a lot of brain energy, I'll be honest. Like, I do a lot of mental work, like um, reading and writing and things like that. So I personally need a little bit more carb um, because your brain mostly runs on glucose. So I do a little bit of maple syrup. Uh, I don't do a lot, but I do a little bit. That's kind of what I do. Um, and I find when I don't do it, um, my brain's just not working. <laughs> What's that? I I add it personally. I, I do um I cut it with a butter. So I do like cause I was in the bulletproof field for a long time. So I still kind of do the bulletproof kind of drinks, or I'll I'll add a fat to it to kind of buffer it so I don't get the carb coma or all of the um insulin response stuff that Rachel was talking about. 
I only do like a teaspoon, maybe half a teaspoon, right? But that helps me get right through, especially in between meals, because especially when you're going through a lot of stress, you do need more carbs. That's kind of why the um, if you're ever in the athletic fields, you know, when people are like biking or you know running long distances and all that, that's why they they always have a glucose of some kind because you can't do it with pure fat or just even protein. Because, I mean, you could, like most people would say, uh, take a more protein, which is generally a good idea. Like if you have like, a sweet craving, you can eat proteins and that'll usually solve it. But sometimes like you might actually just need the carb, uh, just to be honest, just from my own experience, especially if you're a Sloxtizer, because the Sloxtizer needs that uh, easier to assimilate energy than the fast oxidizer. So, I mean, I was slow for a long time, fast now, but so uh, the car, like the little bit of maple syrup really was important for me, especially in the mornings because I'd wake up and your cortisol is a lot higher naturally, right? But when you have adrenal fatigue, usually your cortisol is reversed and it's higher at nighttime and you don't have it in the morning. So I take a sweetener, especially in the morning, to help kind of balance that. That's just what I did, because obviously it's not MD friendly. <laughs> um, yeah. To be honest, the ideal is a balanced oxidizer, which would be pretty much. Um, all of your mineral, your four, first four minerals would be pretty much within the blue and even in a good ratio within each other, which would put you at a balanced oxidation rate. And that was like Dr. X. Um, if you could say like the perfect human, right, the perfect specimen, that would be like what is best. But in my own experience, I have not seen anyone to be um, at a balanced oxidation rate. I more commonly see people in a mixed or in a slow. But if you read any of the metabolic type books, like this one I got right here, uh, the metabolic type and diet, right? William Wol Wolcott, it's by. Um, and, and they're basically, like, they got a lot of nutritional balancing concepts in it. More along the trace elements, ink kind of stuff. But where they say don't take calcium if you have high calcium or something. But um, the idea, ideal would be to have like be a balanced oxidizer. But if you really follow like metabolic typing, you will find that you'll either be uh, more akin to a fast oxidizer or more akin to a slow oxidizer by nature. Um, like I'm from Canada, where we eat fat a lot, <laughs> and I'm in Australia now, where we have more carbs available to us all the time, right? and the temperature is different. So like there is some other things to consider, um, especially with your genetic heritage. If you're European, you do better. If you were um, from like Africa or if you were, you know, <laughs> like I'm in, um, like I said, I'm Canadian and we eat a lot of fats. But now I'm in Australia and my, as soon as I got here, maybe three months later, my oxidation rate changed. <laughs> Right? So, I don't know. To me, I think everyone has their own kind of metabolic rate that's not necessarily the perfect one on a hair test. I just thought I'd share that. Because it, a lot of people do get confused. Like, it's kind of like a flip flop. Like, you're slow, you want to speed it up, and then you're fast, you want to slow it down, right? If you're mixed, then you're out of balance. <laughs> Half the day is fast, half the day is slow. So, you know, like, ideally you just want to have a balanced oxidation rate, right? which I haven't found, to be honest. And I've done, like, hundreds of hair tests. Uh, well, did more than hundreds of hair tests, but hundreds of different people with hair tests, and I don't really count when they have um, a different oxidation rate right? because it changes usually. So ideally you want the ideal one. <laughs> So yeah, um, you'll notice as your oxidation rate does increase, you will most likely experience a lot more healing reactions. 
This is because your body can metabolize things a lot quicker, and it's when it's best to actually approach things. So that's just a little uh, thing that you might want to consider. Like uh, I prefer to be a slow oxidizer personally, um, mostly because I like the supplements better. That's just me. I, I'm not too keen on stress pack or SPF because I'm, I mean I'm in the camp where you got to give. I'm a little different from most and all that. So I like to give nutrition in large amounts so that the body can choose um, which heavy metals to let go of. Whereas um, if you're on a fast oxidizer plant, you might not get as much nourishment as um, a slow oxidizer would. Uh, to me, it kind of like doesn't fit my philosophy. So I prefer to be a slow oxidizer. <laughs> That's me. Even though I naturally eat more fats, like I can, like a quarter stick of butter in the morning, I can do easily, right? Um, there is a cool thing though regarding um, toxins and the symptoms and diseases that you can get, uh, which is kind of like a concept that was put together by, um, I think his name's like Hans Heinrich Reckowig. And he was a, a German medical doctor, and he was also a homeopath. And like a lot of the healing reaction stuff does come from homeopathy, because they kind of coined it, like Herring's Law and all that, which when you hear in the top down, from, you know, that kind of thing, the inside out. Um, but the homotoxicology is really cool in the sense that they kind of describe, like they have a chart of different diseases. So I'll put that in like parentheses, <laughs> you know, quotations, because um, I always see them as healing reactions personally. Um, but when the body's unable to excrete toxins or acids, they, they kind of correlated um, different diseases and they talk about different phases that the body goes through. So they have like, like the excretion phase, phase, which is pretty cool. Um, well, the different phases are pretty cool, not screening stuff. But uh, you can have things like when toxins come out of body orifices, which we've mentioned already in the call, with, you know, candida coming out, things like that, liver flukes and stuff. You can also get things like diarrhea, runny nose, and fever. Inflammation, which is pretty common across the board. You can also have vomiting. So, like, it's not normally seen that it's a... A healing reaction but you can get vomiting as one uh, which is you're not too happy with when like I was saying if you go to see someone and help you with your adrenal fatigue and then you got vomiting as a symptom like, you know you're not too stoked about um, the other one is like a reaction phase which is where uh, toxins are being removed uh, by the body but um, if the excretion is not at a proper rate or at a proper amount, the body uses like an inflammatory response to help neutralize it. So that's when you can get things like fevers, and um, that's pretty much like the fever kind of aspect of a healing reaction. That helps like you know mobilize white blood cells to the area, and it also helps neutralize any bacterial infections that might be in that area. That's why I said I cut my finger. In the cut the tip of it off the other day. First thing that happened, right, outside from bleeding, you know, <laughs> inflammation, right, is because it's going to protect the body from any uh, external microbes entering the body. Um, it's a natural healing phase. It's not fun, but it is. Um, so if the homotoxins or toxins, or the, in homotoxicology, they call homotoxins because homo is like human, right? So if the toxins uh, are not properly excreted even after a deposition phase, phase, a reaction phase, or the excretion, right? Then you get to things called like impregnation, which is when you have like the weakest organ of a body. So you could someone can have like the adrenal issue, congested liver or something like that. And it's when toxins enter those cells and start to actually build up. So we hear that a lot when we talk about uh, copper toxicity, right? And it's in the liver, they say it's in the adrenal gland, they say it's in the brain, right? Um, those are the three major locations, but copper only really does build up if you don't have zinc. 
and if you're not properly mobilizing it and excreting it because if you are have proper bowel movements your body actually has a safety mechanism not to build it up in the tissue so it's actually like a <laughs> like um a more down the line kind of phase when you start to get to the quote unquote copper toxicity kind of stages um, that's when the toxins actually invade the cell and become part of the connective tissue matrix and that's you can call it Pissinger's matrix or something like that and usually you start to have more severe symptoms so like when Lucinda was talking about you know having heavy knees not very much energy you really are down the line she probably had adrenal burnout right it wouldn't be like oh I have like this you <laughs> know not very uh, important thing going on. And then the last phase that they talk about is the degeneration phase. Some people call it something else, like a differentiation phase. And if you know anything about cells, differentiation is when the cell starts to change. So you can get things like um, irreversible damage, they say, where you can get... Um, cellular structures or the enzyme cellular structure can become damaged by large amounts of toxins or damage inflammation or something like that and it kind of affects it like me personally I put I put black walnut husk on my face one time because I thought that was going to be a good idea and that just messed me you know, I've got this nasty thing on my face from it um, but it's just an idea of to understand the degeneration phase when you like burn it and you damage it to the point where your body just kind of has like a scar, right? Deformation. Um, so when you are going through different healing reactions, you do want to make sure you're drinking plenty of water to help flush the toxins out. So you're going either going pee, and you want to kind of rest and relax them is different because they are important you want to make sure that you don't inhibit your bile production because you want to be able to go poop properly you can do the coffee enema which is very helpful or have some herbal teas I know they're not necessarily a nutritional balancing thing he says you can have one or two or something but god forbid you have rooibos tea it's a different conversation <laughs> see the cult diet article by Dr. Wilson um, you can also do um, infrared lamp, which we, most people do because it's probably the easiest to add to your program. And that helps uh, with the bacteria and viruses and things like that. But it, it can be too much and it can push you, like Rachel was talking about, where it can actually um, cause some more healing reactions to happen because when cells start to die off or when... Um, bacteria or any microbe starts to die off in the body it starts to pollute the blood and that's when you actually experience the uh, off kind of symptoms that are kind of classical of the healing reactions um, so like fasting generally well it might help if you're really sick and you got like a cold or something it's actually kind of counterproductive when you're having a healing reaction so I'll just kind of say that. <laughs> Does anyone have anything to add? I just thought I'd kind of top off the call. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, hi, you joined late. No problem, no problem. Right on. That's okay. I understand the timing that I did this call, so it's a little um, awkward for the U.S., but any earlier, and I would have been getting up too early. Um, so that's how that happened. It, it was 9 a.m. when this call started for me. And I, I mean, I was up earlier, but I, I didn't want to get up even more early. So, <laughs> yeah, so... Um, yeah, I guess we could work on like a little document or something that we could add to the Nutritional Balancing Friends group um, files that can help. Um, I would like it if other people shared their information on it, like what helps them and things like that, because 
I mean, I, I can put whatever I want, and that could be it, but I don't think that's right. I think it's important to have, you know, everyone's opinion. And sometimes something helps that might not be on, you know, the Nutritional Balancing Program, which, I mean, the group isn't completely Wilson-based, even though a large portion of the people reside in our group. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. Well, a lot of people have changed, or they've given up, and you know, or they've had this shit since Wilson. But yeah, you know, <laughs> there's a couple of others, but I won't mention them to you know line them out. Aside from that, I think we talked about a lot of different things. The next call, I was hoping to kind of fit UK time, which would mean a lot of the Americans most likely won't be able to meet it because I think UK is about five hours ahead of most Eastern Standard Time at least. I think if this medium does work we'll keep with it for now because I want to keep it free. I don't want to you know have to pay money for Zoom or something if we can do this. So yeah I think it'll help, and as long as we can remember to mute the mics and um, unmute the mics when we want to talk, I think it'll work. Yeah. It's still the first call. I'm still trying to figure out the structure. Um, should we do, like, because um, I did a half hour for the, in the beginning for intro, should I keep it like that and then add a little bit other section kind of time just towards questions and we'll stick to a topic because I'd like to cover some topics in each one but um, also don't want to like the conference calls helpful for connecting like you're saying so should we just add another you know like 20 minutes or something or half hour just to talk and then because we got two hours right we can cut it any way we want yeah Okay. Um, the only thing that is rough for the group calls, it's pretty much it's time now, but the only thing with the group calls is it is difficult to get everyone that I know wants to attend this call. I can give out the emails through the newsletter thing that I set up, um, but I, I made my first beginner's mistake as well. I didn't get anyone's name, so I have like 15 or something like that emails, and I don't know who they are. It's just emails to me. Unless your name is like, you know, very similar to your email address, then I couldn't guess. So I, <laughs> I noticed that like the day before. So um, I will, yeah, I will only ever send the emails just as a reminder when it is, if you're not on Facebook or something, but I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to like market or anything. I don't care about that. It's, it's only for this group at newsletter thing so if you do sign up the link is in the nutritional balancing friends group and uh, I will do reminders for the next call talk about the topic and thinking about adding a section now just to write down some questions you might have you can ask them in the group sort of putting everyone on the spot and uh, yeah it does anyone have a topic in the next couple of ones or anything because I mean I got like 25 different topics from people already that they want to talk about, but I feel like there could be a flow more so with them. <laughs> right now they're kind of random. It's like, you know. <laughs> so if you, it doesn't have to be right now, but if you think anything or if you have an idea of something, just send me a message or something. Let me know. Because right now we have that awkward spot where like you can have to tell me each time before the call if you want to join it. Because I can't figure out how to do like a a way of doing it any other way to get you on the call. It's awkward like that. I had to like, get everyone to add me because <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't find anyone when they weren't on my friends list. So yeah, still learning, but hopefully it turned out okay. Hopefully the recording worked for those who couldn't make it. Yeah, I did. Um, I hope it worked. It's not just me talking because it sucks. 
have such like, boring lives. I don't think they will listen. Yeah. You think they really care about coffee animals? Anyway. Yeah. Guys, I gotta go. Um, have yeah, to do something. It, it was really nice. Uh, really nice meeting you guys. Nice meeting everybody. And, uh, yeah. Take a, care. Happy New Year. Yeah. Oh yeah. Happy New Year and Merry Christmas and and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Happy healing. Bye bye. Happy, uh, keep doing the program. Bye bye.